The Mother Project podcast is brought to you by Nana Grants. Child care plus education equals economic mobility. Nana Grants pays for child care so that low-income single mothers can stay in school. Learn more at nanagrants.org. And I think that I'm able to see people because my experience is so closely related. My journey is so closely related, so I can see it a mile away. You know, the days at food pantries, done that. The days of walking, didn't have transportation, done that. The days of not having a ride to child care, done that. And those experiences of every decision that I make this moment is like is, is is like full circle because many times we keep our stories to ourselves yes. and they don't benefit others and our stories are meant to be told this is erica stevens welcoming you to another episode of the mother project podcast Today, I'm talking with Tracy Palmer. She's the Managing Director of Perscalis, a national workforce development program founded on a really exciting and I think all too novel concept, and that is the idea that a thriving workforce starts with equitable access to education. here with Tracy Palmer and she's with Perscalis. I've had the pleasure of working with Tracy and her organization through Nana Grants, which is a nonprofit that I run that pays for child care for low-income single moms in school. But before we get into talking about Perscalis and the work that you do, really your entire career has been dedicated to this type of work. I'd like to talk about your personal life because I was so excited to hear your story. It sounds like it's it has really informed your professional journey. So I always start with I'm a I'm an African American girl from a small town in West Virginia, and the, every time I say that, everybody pauses and there's like. I didn't know there were black people in West Virginia. So I always start there. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, we're everywhere. Um, but I grew up in a really small town outside of Charleston called Dunbar, West Virginia, in a very impoverished place. Now, I can say that now, but growing up, I didn't know it was impoverished because it was it, it was it was such a village. So it's even funny because we all grew up on, most of my family grew up on Smoot Avenue. My mom is one of 10. Wow. I'm the middle child of three. And so I lived at 116 Smoot Avenue. My grandmother lived at 120 Smoot Avenue. My aunt lived at, I think, 111 and a half. And then another one lived at another, all on this street. What a gift. Yes. I, as I look at it now, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I was surrounded by love. But I grew up in a time where kids rode bikes. You came in when the street lights were on. The neighbors, uh, when you were doing something wrong, the neighbors disciplined you. And then they called your parents, and they disciplined you, too. So I grew up in a time where there was a village, but also what a lot of people didn't know, and a lot, and a lot of people are still finding out, is that although we looked like the the American dream, there was it was it was it was a tumultuous upbringing. So I grew up with my mom and my dad, and you know my sister and my brother. Um, I grew up with what looked like the the like the best in my neighborhood, very poor neighborhood, but I had a mom and a dad, like most people didn't have a mom and a dad, and they both were in the house. But behind closed doors, it was a lot of arguing, it was a lot of fighting, mm-hmm. a lot of instability was going on, but we were taught, like like almost keeping up with the Joneses, when you go out in public... You look like you're together. You have everything tucked in. You know, you lotioned up. Oh, you yeah. say please and yes. thank you. And It's all behind the scenes. It's all behind the scenes. And so I learned to swallow my emotions for many, many years. So my mom and dad had this tumultuous relationship. And when I entered into high school, while my dad was at work, my mom moved us all out of the house. So my dad was at work. He was an electrician, trained electrician. He was out of work, and 
all of a sudden she's like, just get all your stuff, get all your stuff, get all your stuff. And so we got all our stuff together and we moved down the street to one of my aunt's houses. Wow. She lived in an apartment, public housing. Mm -hmm. And we moved and we lived with her in a two bedroom. So there were about 10 of us, if not more, in this two bedroom until my mom could get grounded. And so when she got grounded, we moved across the street into a trailer. It's a two bedroom trailer. And we lived nearly a rock throw from my dad. And so my dad would come and, you know, it would just be even more tumultuous. But around this time, I met, I met, I met a, a guy, you know, like, and I was like, okay, this is the, the solution. This is going to make me feel better. Somebody's paying attention to me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I thought, fell in love. So here I am, this, this Christian girl who goes to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, you know, I'm doing all the things that are supposed to be right. I'm an athlete. I'm a cheerleader. I'm doing all these things that I think is supposed to be right. I get good grades. And I end up pregnant. Wow. Not in the plan. Not in the plan at all. Here I am, you know, I'm getting, you know, um, girl state. It was one of these things in high school that my teacher chose me to go to. Um, and I found out that I'm pregnant. And my world shifted. And so I had to, you know, I had to, I lived with my How mom. How old were you? I was 17. Okay. I was 17. And the, I want to say that first pregnancy, the first pregnancy, I, my mom was like, you know, we have to do something. We have to do something. This is not going to be your existence. And so she took me and, and I'll, I'll leave that there. Mm -hmm. But then I became pregnant again. Wow. I became pregnant again. I was 18 years old, and I'm like, you know what? This is going to happen. This is going to happen. I was still with uh, my child's father, mm -hmm. and I remember telling my dad. So my dad had no knowledge of the first pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I told my dad, and he said to me, your life is over now, Tracy. And I'll never forget those words. I'll never forget those words. I just graduated from high school. I'm pregnant. I give birth, and, and now I'm I don't know what my plan is. My plan is, everybody asks me, when you grow up, what do you want, what do you, what do you want to be? I want to be a businesswoman or, or a fashion designer. That was always my answer. That was always my answer. And people saw potential in me. I came from this great family. I had good grades, et cetera, et cetera. But now this, this epitome of what a young person should be is now a race because I'm pregnant. Or you told it had been. Well, you I'm were told, told it had been erased. Absolutely. And mom, I, I, don't, I, I almost think like my mom shut down during that period because mm -hmm. there wasn't like much conversation. You know, it was just like she just helped me raise my son. And so I had a um, family, I mean, a good friend that I grew up with whose mom worked at the Department of Labor. She said, Tracy, if you come up here and take this test, for me, I don't know what kind of test, take this test and you can... Um, pass on the 10th grade level, I can get you in college for free. So I'm like, sign me up. I caught the public bus, you know, got on the bus, went up there, took the test, and I passed. And she was like, you're going to be able to go to school. You know, they're going to pay for your books. They're going to pay for a stipend, um, for lunch, and for transportation. They're going to help you get your associate's degree. You just got to follow the program. And so I enrolled in West Virginia State University, mm -hmm. and I went through the Job Training Partnership Act. Um, for two years, and I got my associate's degree, and it was tough because I remember there was one semester, um, the semester before I actually gave birth, that I had to. So it's kind of rural in a sense where I came from. There was like there was a bus, but from where I lived, there was a golf course that separated what we called the bottom, okay. Dunbar, West Virginia, from the college. So there was this huge golf course that separated the two. And so I can't remember how many months pregnant I was. I would have to walk from my home in the bottom, cross this huge golf course. <laughs> <sighs> wow. To the college, yeah. you know, for sometimes 8 or 9 o'clock classes. And so I did that. I gave birth. And then child care became the issue, which it always does mm -hmm. for single moms. Mm -hmm. My, my son's father was unstable. He was in a life of crime. No other word to describe. He was in a life of crime. Mm -hmm. And my mom worked. She worked at one of the local chemical plants. Where I'm from, the industry in there is only working for the college or working really for the chemical plant. Those are the only industries there. Okay. So she worked for the chemical plants, retired there after 30 years. And so she had to go to work. 
So my mom had to go to work. I had to go to school. The only other person I had as a support system was my son's father. And his life was unstable. Mm -hmm. And so I had to rely on him. You know, in hindsight, thinking back on it, like, oh, there's nothing but grace. Something was, like, protecting me. So much could have gone wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And so he would come. um, Once I actually gave birth, he would come. Sometimes not on time. Mm -hmm. Had no respect to time. Mm -hmm. Pick up my son and either keep my son until I got out of school or drop him off at his, at, you know, his mom's house. And, my, and so that went on, I want to think, a good, seemed like a year. So I would miss classes. You already know how I'd be late for classes. Yeah. I was able still to persevere. I got my associate's degree. Went on to get my bachelor's degree because I was like, I'm not stopping. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not stopping because I always understood that education was the key, just didn't know how to articulate that. Because my dad went to college, didn't finish. My mom never went to college. Okay. Um, so I graduated, and I remember, just a, a just a little di- digression, I remember, like, I think it was my first year, I was called into, I, I want to say, like, the provost chancellor's office. I can't even remember. And I'm so ignorant to the college things. Mm-hmm. I go into this room. I just have this, I get this thing in the mail. You, you have to appear in this room at this time. I go into this room, and there had to be 10, 15, 20 administrators around this huge table. I walk into this room, and they're like, do you know why you're here? I'm like, no. <laughs> they were like, this is an appeals hearing. If we don't grant you a, an affirmative appeal, we're going to kick you out of college. Why? Because my, my grades had lapsed, so I, there was a semester not understanding college, where I was so late at so many classes, I took a W okay. instead of like a WP. I think that's what, what, what it is in college. And those credits counted negatively against my GPA. So I had retaken the classes, but didn't realize that the first MAR, the w, w, I, yeah. WF, whatever it is, was a MAR. And so I'm going through college thinking like, everything is great. I repeated these classes. They're uh-huh. like, if we don't give you an affirmative, you know, vote here. You were going to get kicked out of school. Don't you think that happens to a lot of kids who don't have, if they're a first-generation college student, they don't have someone who's been through the bureaucracy of the college experience to guide them? Absolutely, and they give you those classes. I think it was like College 101 or University 101, something like that, that you're supposed to learn those things in. But when you're pregnant... yeah. You're distracted. You have Maslow things happening. Yes. You're like, what? I'm not paying attention in this class. This is an easy, you know, C. You know, I always I, say that Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. If you're so busy worrying about, you know, how am I going to pay the rent? My child is sick. I'm exhausted. I haven't had any sleep. It, Getting an A and having a 4.0 is kind of low on your right. by I'm, necessity. I'm trying to get by. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. trying to get by, and they, I'm in there, and they're like, well, tell us why we should we should keep you, why we should vote affirmatively for you. And I'm like, well, I, I had a baby. They're like, you had a baby? I was like, yeah, I had a baby, and I I, I just remember that. And they, they said, well, basically, like, if you can prove, like, that story to be true, then we will, we will affirmatively grant this. And I remember uh, coming back, and it's funny, like, having a child like mine sometimes, or not being informed. I remember I came back with the the medical bracelet that they put on the baby uh-huh. after you had give birth. Yeah. I remember I cut it off and kept it as a, like a memento, mm-hmm. and I came back in with that. And they were like, oh, they probably thought I was ignorant at the time, but they probably <laughs> felt sorry for me. But I'm like, see, uh-huh. you, you know, I, I had a, I had a baby, and I just remember, I just remember them saying, you know, we're gonna let you back in school. We're gonna give you a chance, but you got to make this happen. And so I remember just from that point forward, just being very dogged about making sure that everything was taken care of. And so I, I stayed in school. I graduated. I got my bachelor's degree. I even worked for the college while I was in school. I got a work-study job. I became the student manager of the student union facility. And then I graduated. I haven't heard you yet mention fear. Like, it didn't sound like you were especially afraid when you were faced with possibly... I was definitely afraid okay because I didn't have any advice uh-huh. the support that I looked for outside of my family was in a life of crime and he wasn't exactly like the pillar of the community nor knew how to support mm-hmm. he probably didn't know in hindsight 
My mom had went quiet. So I was definitely a fear. I was definitely afraid, but I think it's one of those things as a single moms, you make lemonade out of lemons mm -hmm. and you do it scared. You do it in the face of fear. Fear becomes so a part of what you do that you just do it and you kind of like, you, you swallow it because you have a, a, a little yes. person who is depending on you to make it happen no matter what. So wipe those tears, push past the fear because somebody is depending on you and that's greater than you. And so I just push past it. Mm -hmm. I push past it. I push past it. I remember just like, uh, and I'm dating myself. When I was growing up in elementary school, they used to have this thing called Mr. Green, Mr. Green Jean, I think it was, Mr. Yuck Mouth. Okay. <laughs> and so they used to teach us, okay, you put Mr. Yuck Mouth on every um, cleaning detergent that is hazardous. I just remember they come to the schools. Mm -hmm. And so they gave us like these, this little paper full stickers. of stickers. Okay. And so when you went home, you put Mr. Uh, Yuck Mouth on everything so that uh -huh. nobody would swallow it or ingest it. Sure. But I think about fear. And every time I felt fear... I felt like I could almost, like, in my stomach, I just had this ill feeling that made me think that my face looked like Mr. Yuck Mouth. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I still, to this day, whenever I have that fear feeling, uh -huh. I'll say to my husband or to my friends, I got that Mr. Yuck Mouth feeling today. And so I, I think I just swallowed that Mr. Yeah. Yuck Mouth feeling so much. And I was almost like I was just, like, I was living, but I wasn't present. Okay. Did you, so many of the moms I work with through Nana Grants are experiencing stories a lot like what you've described, and many of them don't ask for help when they are faced with a situation like being called into, you know, into a, a room with a bunch of administrators. Why do you think that is? I think as... I think as, as women, and then particularly as a woman of color, I think our we, we're, we're taught that you have to be strong. So again, my mom is one of 10, and out of those 10 um, siblings, eight of them are women. And I just remember growing up, I think maybe one or two of my aunts were married outside of my mom. Mm. And so I, I grew up around really strong women that were raising you know, children on their own. And so the only model that I had was this strong black woman. And then my grandmother, uh -huh. who was, you know, my grandmother raised her children. Her, their father died when they were relatively young. I just remember her walking to the bus stop as a small child, you know, and cleaning other people's houses mm -hmm. to make ends meet. You know, mom, there, there were 10 of them, and they grew up in like a two-bedroom home. Mm -hmm. And so I only saw strength. Okay. And I did not... Stoicism almost, right? Strength and... Quiet fortitude, don't show. And they never talked about it. There, mm -hmm. You know, there's this saying, you know, growing up, you know, um, when the grown-ups are talking, the children you leave the space and leave the room. And if you go into that space mm -hmm. while grown-ups are talking, you are going to be punished. So I just remember being in, you know, in public housing, one of the apartments that my aunt lived in, and all of the adults being, like, in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And all the kids being, like, in the living room, and the adults are having conversations. So I'm sure... They probably were sharing, you know, what was going on mm -hmm. in their world, but we didn't see an outlet. And so I grew up being strong. I also grew up in domestic violence. Yes. So in domestic violence, you know, vulnerability is weakness Yes. in domestic violence. And then it, I end up being in a relationship that's domestic violence. You know, my son's father, it was, it was, it was a, not only verbally abusive, but it was physically abusive. And so you swallow because you don't want anybody to know. Yeah. You know, I'm the pillar of what people think are success. I, you know, before having a baby, and now I have to keep up these appearances so they won't win. So it's all, it, it, it all informs how you show up in this world. Yes. And so when you need help, you don't ask for help because also, here's, here's a big piece. My pet peeve, when people ask me what my pet peeve is, and I always say my pet peeve is disappointment. And so asking for help and someone says no or I can't oh, help you mm. makes me feel disappointed, which is the feeling that I never want to be in touch with. Okay. And so I learn not to ask people for things so I won't get disappointed. Okay. But to my detriment. And I then I, it becomes generational. Yeah. Because then I pass that on to my son whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. 
And and so I graduated from college. When I graduated from college, because I worked at the college as a work study student, they offered me a job after I graduated from college. Still having these childcare instabilities because wow. I didn't have a car, I didn't have a license. Depended on you know my mom to drop me off on her way to work every day. But my son, here's the here's here's the crazier thing. I don't know why I was thinking I even did this. I enrolled my son in a daycare program through aid from the government Mm -hmm. that was maybe 10 miles away from where I lived, but it was the best program for him. Okay. And I said, you know, I'm going to figure out how to get him every day. And you didn't have a car. And I didn't have a car. And there was, was there public transportation? There was public transportation, but so he was in daycare in a city called South Charleston. I lived in Dunbar. There was a bridge that separated Dunbar from Charleston and so in order to get from Dunbar to Charleston on public assistant, it did a round. It went around. So it went from it went from Dunbar to like Charleston, which is like twenty five miles, over a bridge in the west side of Charleston, and then it came back. Okay. So that's like an hour like trip. And so I would have to basically on the days that my mom got off from work early, perfect. She would pick him up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I had to ask a girlfriend, like, to take my son and drop them off. My girlfriend couldn't do it. Then I had a cousin who would take them and pick them up. It, 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 I just had to depend on people that I felt like I trusted mm-hmm. to take them and pick them up. But there were days where I was sitting at work and I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, it's, it's five o'clock. Yes. I don't have a ride. And I would have to like ask like a random Stranger, somebody I didn't know really well, somebody that thought that I had everything put together. Yes, I would just have to ask them for a ride. Like, can you give me a ride? I'll pay you. And sometimes I was right up until the minute of getting there because I had to find somebody to give me a ride just to pick myself. But it was the best education for him. Yeah, it was. It it was tough when he went to elementary school. I was so relieved because no longer. Did I have to find this child care for him? I at least had the school system to, you know, providing education, but also being somewhere where he could go for child care. It, 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 it was a tough space. Mm. And so I, I, I graduated from college. They asked me to take a job at the college. Whew, relief. Mm-hmm. Um, the college, so, I presume, did not have a child care center. They had a child care center, but the waiting list was so long. Oh, okay, yes, yes. That it wasn't even an option. Mm-hmm. You know, I asked, you know, can I, you know, it was right across the campus. It was like, oh, all the staff's kids go yes. here. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's booked for years. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even try that as an option, mm-hmm. you know. And so, he, he you know, um, so it, it's funny. So I worked at the college, and I would ask my work-study students. So now I became a staff person. So sometimes I would ask my work-study student to take me to pick up my child. Uh-huh. Or... On the days after he went to elementary school, I would send them to go pick him up from the bus stop. I know that sounds so crazy now in hindsight. Well, you had to be resourceful. Had to be resourceful. Had to be resourceful. It just was, it just became, it just became an instinct. But isn't that also exhausting? Because it's really what you're describing is constant low-level stress. Terribly exhausting. But you, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily have the words for that. Mm-hmm. You know, or particularly when you have somebody depending on you, it's like you don't even have, you, you can't be tired. You can't be exhausted. I can't depend on my son's father to pick him up. You know, my mom, depending on her work schedule, may not be able to pick him up. You know, I've asked him for these random rides to pick him up. You know, it, 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 it was just the craziest thing. And so then, of course, he went to elementary school. Thank God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he went to elementary school. But, I, but here's the other thing. The bus stop and I, from West Virginia gets brutally cold. The bus stop, I would say, was at the top of the campus. So I ended up living at the bottom of the campus, but it was at the top of the campus. I know that sounds, it was a really long walk. Uh-huh. And so on those days where it was freezing cold, oh, I just remember just like, oh, my gosh, what would happen if he didn't go to school today? <laughs> because it's so cold and yeah. I have to walk into this bus stop. Yeah. And I would walk into this bus stop, and I, and I remember that kind of like she – in hindsight, build up like my plan to move. So every day I would walk into this bus, I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. It's freezing cold. And I got this little kid with me. and oh. he, He's just happy, you know. <laughs> he doesn't understand. They're not 
affected generally yeah. by <laughs> heat and cold. Right. I'm, I'm taking them to this bus stop, but I'm th- in my mind, I'm like, something's got to change. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. I don't know what, mm-hmm. but I know something's got to change. I can't live like this. I can't live like this. And I just, I, I, I'm, it's, it's ironic. So, again, I have, I have like 30 cousins, first cousins. Some, I, ran out of, I ran out of numbers to count. But we all, for some reason, went to Philadelphia to visit my sister. We, we went to Philadelphia. It was, I think it was like six or seven of us. We're laying on my sister's bed in Philadelphia. I don't even remember how we even got to Philadelphia, which is a crazy thing. We're in Philadelphia, we're laying on our bed, and we all say, you know what, we're all going to move to Atlanta. And one lived in California. Um, a couple of us lived, you know, in West Virginia. My sister, of course, lived in Philadelphia. And we all was like, we're going to move to Atlanta. How, how crazy is that thought? Mm-hmm. Now I think back on it. Thank God I didn't know what I didn't know because I probably wouldn't have moved. <laughs> It's when you're young and you don't realize how absurd your your dreams and plans can be. You totally know? Which absurd. is why you, you, you think back on grown-ups looking at you like and shaking their head like, <laughs> and you're just oblivious, which is what gets... And now you're here. You're in Atlanta. Are any of your cousins here? That, so we all moved. Well, let me, let, me, let me back up. We all decided we were moving January the 1st of 2001. Yes, of 2001. So January came, and everybody moved except me. Everybody moved except me, because they're that fear thing. Yes. Came again, then I had my son's father's like, you can't take my son away from me. Then you have all those naysayers saying, why are you moving? People that never left the city, why are you moving? Are you scared? Do you have a job? All these things are going around, and all I'm thinking is I need a better life for my son. Yeah. And I remember one of the last conversations I had with someone before I like made the leap. They were like, well, what are you going to do when you get there? How are you going to succeed? I said, well, you know what? I can always come back. Mm -hmm. My mom still lives here. I can always come back. And so in March, I I finally made the the leap in March. So they were settled. Uh They all lived in one apartment, which is crazy. They all lived in one apartment. And then here I come with my son in tow, Uh joining them. And so we were there maybe a month. I had this one little closet that was my space. My, mine and my son's space, so I kept my stuff. I was able to get a job. I worked at Botter Fashion College. Oh, yes. Yeah. Worked I at Botter, that. Worked at Botter Fashion College, and maybe a month or so after being here, we, me and one of my other cousins moved into an apartment complex that was, like, right um, around the corner from the original apartment mm-hmm. complex. And I lived there for uh, about four years. But, again, didn't drive, didn't have my license. Mm-hmm. I'm new to a city, just enrolled my son in the school. You got that now? Here, 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 what rears his head. After school, after school care. Yeah. So I, so I lived in Morrow, Georgia, which is in Clayton County. The job that I landed is in Buckhead. Wow. And so not convenient. Not convenient. And, again, I have no context as to Atlanta. Because, you know, when people say you live in Atlanta, it could be Marietta. It sure. could be Henry County. <laughs> Everybody. So yeah, when it's somebody sprawling. Says, right. So when somebody says, oh, we got, here's this job in, 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 in Buckhead in Atlanta, I'm thinking, oh, this is, this is like West Virginia. Mm-hmm. It's around the corner. <laughs> and I remember my first day at work. So I set him up with um, paying out of pocket at first. Um, Kinder Care, I think was the name of the program, Kinder Care. And so he, he went to after. Mm-hmm aftercare there but it got so expensive Mm -hmm. and and here's the crazy part that first job in Atlanta paid twenty four thousand dollars not enough to live on thank god I had a roommate but it wasn't enough yeah and so when I left West Virginia I took out the money that I had in my 401k so I was really only existing for those first six months off of the that 401k because twenty four thousand dollars isn't enough to do anything no and so he was in kinder care until the money ran out. And so I, ha- I, for some reason, I found out about a program at the school where she he could go to aftercare, after school, and I think it was like $30 a week. But I worked in Buckhead, and he had to be picked up by 6 o'clock. And I got off at 5. So it's interesting. Um, a lot of people I talk to think once you get that degree, like, okay, you know, we're, we are breaking this cycle of poverty by helping a single mom get a degree, it really doesn't. The, the child care 
doesn't challenge go away. does not end. It, it, it does not go away unless you live in a multi generational home. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 go, it never goes away. No. It never goes away. And I didn't have a car. And I worked in Buckhead. So what would happen is my roommate worked um, downtown. I would ride with her to downtown. You know, I had to give her gas money, even though she's going to the same place. Would give her gas money. She would drop me off at the train station. I would catch the Marta at Peachtree Center Station. Catch the Marta from Peachtree Center Station to Buckhead. Mind you, I am a total rural West Virginia girl. Yeah. I know nothing about train and bus systems outside yes. of what I'm used to. <laughs> yeah. my, my first day to riding the train, she just dropped me off at the train station and basically was like, figure it out. Mm-hmm. So I learned the MARTA system. I, I know I still know the MARTA system to this day. So I would, I would, she would drop me off. I would get on the train. I would catch the train either to the, um, the Buckhead station or the Lenox station, depending on the route. And here's the thing that people... The privilege that some people have, they just think, oh, you can just catch the train. It's not quite that easy. If you miss your connection, Mm -hmm. you may be standing outside in the elements for 15 to 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or if you miss your connection, you may have to wait an hour or more for another connection. Mm -hmm. And so I would catch the train. So it was pretty easy going to Buckhead. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. It was pretty easy for the most part going to Buckhead. Um. But depending on if I went to the Buckhead station or the Lenox station, one depending on I had to walk. So if I made it to the Lenox station, oh, it was yeah. great. If that was the connection going to the Lenox station, it was great. I got off, I, I walked across the street, I went into the job. If I, if I was at the Buckhead station, that meant I had to walk up a hill. Mm-hmm. So I would have to walk up this hill. <laughs> in have, August in Atlanta. August yeah. or the elements. Or, yeah, or rain, yes. Mm-hmm. The other thing that people don't think about is when you ride Marta, you have to, you have to, be, you have to be in tune with the weather. Because mm-hmm. you can't just, like, if it's going to rain mm-hmm. and you haven't watched the weather, you're wet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or if it's cold and you don't have a coat, you're cold. And so I remember, so I had made this arrangement with my roommate. I don't get off in enough time to pick up my, my son on some days. She, so she would pick him up from the child care. But here's the other thing, Erica. $24,000. I sometimes didn't have the money to pay the child care. And so I never said it to her, but I was like, oh, I'm glad she has to pick him up because I know I'm going to have a past due balance there. Oh, they won't ask yes. her for it. Yes. And so she would come home. She's like, they asked me, did you have the money again? And I would, you know, yeah, I'll get it. I'll yes. get it. I'll get it. And, you know, eventually they were like, listen, if you don't pay this bill and pay it regularly, we're going to kick your son out of this program. And, by the way, if you're ever late, we you charge you fees. by the minute. Yes. And if you're not here by X amount of time, we call defects. Mm-hmm. And so there were times where, like, she wanted to go to after work type of thing or she was sick that day. Mm-hmm. I would have to totally orchestrate all of that. And I signed up for this program. It's, it's, it's funny how resourceful you become. It was called BATMA, Buckhead Area Management Transportation Association, I think it was. I, I don't even know how I found out about it, Erica. But this basically, this plan was, it was it was a clean campaign. It was designed for people to car, carpool. Okay. They mm-hmm. didn't know I didn't have a car. Okay. <laughs> they didn't know I didn't have a car or a license, Erica, but I signed up anyways. <laughs> I signed up anyways. And, and so what it gave me, through signing up for this program, it gave me $50 a month uh-huh. to give to my roommate. For being a carpooler, a okay, driver. Okay. And it gave me five vouchers. It was like these triplicate form. It gave me, send me in the mail, five triplicate forms that any time my ride mm-hmm. had an issue, mm-hmm. I could use these five cab vouchers. The five cab vouchers were good for the year. Okay. So I would have to ration out. Those were your emergency. Those were my emergency plans for when okay. she had something else to do. It, it, it was oof. that is brilliant actually I have to say <laughs> that is brilliant you become resourceful in in spaces of nothingness I you know I, I when when we have student moms applying for Nana grants one of the things we ask is that they give us a um, financial worksheet mm-hmm. and I will look at these worksheets and I'm adding it up and adding it up again and I'm like this does not add up and, and you just, you, and I saw my own mom do it 
you just somehow make it work. It, 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 I, I call it the fishes and loaves yeah, <laughs> situation you where you just don't even know how it's where it's coming from, but just somehow, you know, if you're fortunate, it's you, a miracle. You can make it work. Um, so tell me how you got from that to what you do now, because you, it, your career, it seems like, has really centered on working with populations who are experiencing the same challenges that you did. Is that, was that by design? It was not by design because, you know, like I want to be a fashion designer and, or a businesswoman. Didn't know how to do that, what that meant. You know, it's it just a circle in my head. But I realized, so that job at Botter Fashion College was student services. Okay. Student support services. I was a student's student services coordinator. I didn't know what that meant. I just mm-hmm. knew it was at a fashion college and I wanted to work there and I needed the job because I just moved to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could dress really flashy there. <laughs> that's all I knew, Erica. I, I, that's all I knew. I didn't even negotiate my salary. I, I didn't do any of that. I, was, I didn't know. College didn't teach me that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I just found that I was, I was, I was drawn to single mothers, people who were hurting people who were in pain because in that role I was responsible for like transitional services, you know, Mart. I, I, I sold the discounted MARTA passes, mm-hmm. you know, any obstacles people were having, they would come in my office and talk to me about it. Didn't really still hindsight being 2020 didn't even really understand that like this was like becoming purpose work. Okay. So it wasn't an intentional type thing. It just became my thing, and as I've been learning about MARTA, and as I'm learning about BATMA, mm-hmm. and as I'm learning these different things, I'm giving this information to the students. Yeah. You know, and so it just became, oh, it became a passion thing. As I look at, at it now, they were totally, like, gauging me for retention of the yeah. students. Mm-hmm. So, oh, go see Tracy. Okay. Go see, at the time, Miss Lewis, because I wasn't married. Okay. Go see Miss Lewis. And I would talk to them, and they would be better, and so they just start sending me. Sending me all so when students. a student say you know couldn't afford a book or their transportation they you know their car broke down or they, they they sent them to you they sent them to me and mm-hmm. and and I didn't have resources like I didn't have a budget to give them like anything oh my goodness so I was totally just telling them you know my experience and you know talking wow. to them you know about my childcare about Batma about just different things and it, it, I I realized like okay this is this is purpose work. This is purpose work, but again, I'm in my own struggle. Yeah. So you can't be really intentional about it. Yeah. So I, I got promoted to the manager, still doing the same thing, still struggling myself, still buying. I am purchasing the discounted MARTA passes that I'm selling. Yeah, yeah. So you were in it with them, really. I, I'm in it with them. Do they know that? Absolutely not. They're just like, oh, she's really nice. She has you know good information. She listens to us. She seems real. You know, because, yeah. you know, approachable, approachable. No I'm still relatively young. I'm just out of college. They're in college. So they could identify mm-hmm. with me as well as me being able to tell them. And then in addition to that, something that I didn't say is in the midst of all of this, my son's father was killed. Oh, my. Because I remember him just like, like, I, I need my son. To, I, I want my son back in West Virginia. At least you can send him for the summer. And I remember thinking, I remember just because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person of faith, I remember, you know, praying, you know, and just just feeling like, okay, Tracy, this is the summer that you need to send him. Because in my mind, I remember hearing, this is the summer you need to send him because you never know. This, this could be the last summer. I don't know why I thought that, Erica. Okay. And I sent my son for the summer to, to live with his dad to play football. So he's in Pee Wee football. Mm-hmm. I sent him to my, 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 my son's father was a, a, a athlete and he was great in football. That was part of like his legacy. Sure. And so here's his birthright, you know. Yeah. So I sent him there. And I remember one morning, no, one, well, it was morning, early in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, I got a call from one of my best friends. And they were like, Tracy, you're like, I need you to sit down. And I'm like, what's going on? Son's father was murdered. And they can't find your son. And finally, I got a call um, from his mom saying, your son is fine. Jawan is fine. He knows nothing about what's going on. He knows nothing. Okay. I, was, I had to tell my son. I had to tell my son. I think my son may have been seven-ish 
around that time, and I had to tell him, you know, his his the person he looks up to, I had to tell him that he he you know he was killed. And I remember my son just like breaking down, and I'm trying to be strong, but he he breaks down, and and it was one of the pivotal moments, like like in my life, like thank you that I left. So he was sitting in a car with a young lady, and someone shot him while he was sitting in a car. Shot them both while they were sitting in the car. Oh my gosh! And so I thought, like, I like I had like this like out of body experience. Like that could have been me if I would have stayed in in Charleston. I may have been the person sitting in the car with yeah. them. Yeah. And, and my leaving Atlanta was 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 a way of of, of missing all that. Um, removing yourself from that whole situation. Yeah, removing myself and from, your son. Yeah, from that whole situation. And so we came back to Atlanta. I actually did one of the eulogies at his funeral because it, it, it was tough, but it was like some, some things that needed to be said. And so then I'm back in Atlanta dealing with death, Yeah. dealing with, you know, my Maslow needs. Yes, doing purpose work, all things that are pulling from me mm-hmm. and not knowing how to refill that. If not for my faith, I don't know how I would have stood through it all. And so I carry that into my work as well. So when I'm talking to, you know, single moms, that authenticity of that real experience, I can say, listen, I, I, I can see you. Mm-hmm. I totally see you. And I'm able to have like some breakthrough conversations with moms and so that has that experience those experiences inform every conversation so I I just think of the conversations when I worked at year up tell us what year up is about so year up is a workforce development program that is a holistic approach so it not only does the the tech skills it also does the soft skills and the Maslow needs yes and so I can see me And the students walk a mile away. Yes. And so whenever someone was, like, not doing well in the program, I could see it. And so my team, because I led a team of about 60 staff there, my team, whenever they couldn't get through to a student, they would just send them to me. And so I would just take them into, like, a room, and I I would listen. You have to be an active listener. Mm -hmm. And then I I I would share my story. Whether it was a, a young lady or a young man, I would share my story. And instantly, they're like, okay. They would, you know, give you. Open up. They would open up. And so and, I was able to give resources that way because, again, they're, they're, they're used to being strong. They're used to not asking for help. Or if they received help, it was in a, it was it was kind of a quid pro quo. Sure. There were so many strings attached. With so many strings attached. And I learned in this, I learned in that environment that family is a word that you don't throw around. Mm-hmm. So some, I, would, I would go in and say, oh, we're your family. And they would be like, family, family. My family doesn't do what right by me. So family is not a positive connotation to everyone, mm-hmm. depending on your your support system. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I stopped using that word family and went to your support system. So what's your support system look like? And so I, I would share with them, and I was able to get through. Listen, I, one New Year's, I think it was last year, I went through, like, my phone. Because, you know, you get those group texts on New Year's. Like, Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy Holidays. And I was like, no, I want to be personal. Mm-hmm. And so I've worked at this point, working at Year Up. I worked at Botter. I worked at, you know, in two rows at Botter. I worked at American Intercontinental University, which is a college. Mm-hmm. I worked at Everest, you know, Everest Institute. And so I've mentored at this hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of students, you know. Mm-hmm. And, man, it's, 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 it, it, it makes me... Like, so emotional, but I went through my phone, and I was like, I'm going to be very personal, and I'm going to send them a message. Everybody that I saved in my phone, I'm going to send them a message. It's like a personal message. And I think two or three hours went by, and I was still texting. Because I had, you know, yeah. everybody that was in my phone, and and the responses were just confirmation. And filled you back up. And filled me back up to be able to go back in there and do more of that work. Because I think people forget like that workforce development work is really hard and purpose work, work is even that much harder. And so when you're doing those consecutively mm-hmm. together, you you pour from empty. Yes. I was pouring from empty many days, you know, and I would leave there. I was I always used to tell my teams, like it's not heavy lifting, like I'm lifting a couch. 
But when I get when I get home at, at night, I I am empty. You know, it's heavy heart lifting. Yes. And so I'm exhausted. And and the thing I also I always tell single mothers is like you can pour from empty, and when you are pouring from empty, you have to make sure that you're checking on your child because they're learning some some generational curses mm. from you just surviving that they will take into their families. And so while you're breaking down, add some space to check in on your child because you're mm. teaching them things that you don't even know that you're teaching them. Mm. I had to be faith-filled in that walk because I, I know that this this new opportunity, something that I learned is, is, is supposed to be for someone else. I'm supposed to relay that information, much like moving to Atlanta, much like not being able to have child care, much like being able to navigate MARTA, making ends meet on $24,000, my son's father being killed. All of that is, 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 is I'm supposed to share with someone else in this journey. So tell tell us about your role at Perscalis because it seems perfectly I mean you've done some stuff that is perfectly tailored to your skill set and life experience and the gifts you're bringing to the table but this really seems aligned for you. Absolutely. It, it's it's more purpose work. And so Perscalis is is a workforce development program that connects people of color, people in, you know, communities where we're not looking at with careers in tech. And so for they come in with one wage and and our our metrics is that they leave with four times what they were making when they came in. And so our average salary in Atlanta, uh, once they complete our program, is $22. So you can imagine making minimum wage and at the end of this, you have credentials, you're working in IT in the corporate sector and now you're making 22 dollars an hour Mm -hmm. that's life changing that's life altering and you do this in the span of 12 to 15 weeks which is tremendously important because like we support moms who are getting four-year degrees and when you've got four years of everything you described you know having this it's almost like Jenga you know one (laughs) little piece gets pulled out and the whole thing collapses and if you can condense that I mean, and, and there's a there's a privilege associated with thinking that people can can their Maslow needs can wait while you get training. Yes, you know because bills are still due, your kids are still in school, you still yes. have to eat, you still have to be clothed, you still need transportation, you still need child care. Yes. That doesn't stop because you're in a program from eight thirty until four thirty every day. Life does not stop for a single mom. No, you know, and so. Being able to be part of a program. So, you know, prior I was in a, um, led a program that was a year long. You know, I was in the college, you know, of course it's four years, and that was a program that was a year long. This is 12 to 15 weeks to see change in your family and generationally. And so we not only help with the hard skills, it's also the soft skills. You know, it's also the, the financial literacy. This is something that I learned um, working in the workforce development space. Like, people always come in, we want to do financial literacy, we want to do financial literacy, we want to do financial literacy. Financial literacy is, is, is super, don't get me wrong. But when you don't have anything to balance for somebody to come in to you and say, you should have a savings <laughs> of $1,300. It's very presumptuous. It's very presumptuous when I don't even, with what I make, mm-hmm. I can't even pay all the bills that I have. And so you're talking to me about a savings. When you're a single mom and... You don't have the means. Short term is the only place you can live. Yes. It's the only place you can dream long term. But in terms of your dollars and cents, it's short term. And so one thing throws off everything. So you may have put $75 to the side to start your savings. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, a child gets sick. One trip to the urgent care. Wipes it out. Wipes that out. The copay. Or, or, or the, just the, to be seen, not even counting the, the bills. Yep. Yeah, I, I just remember when, 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 I was, when I first moved to Atlanta and I didn't have a car. My son got sick. He had a fever, like 106. And I lived um, in this apartment complex, and there was a CVS, maybe a mile walk. I remember not having a car. I'm at home with my son, not having child care, having to walk. Leave my son with 106 degree temperature in the apartment. Oh, my goodness. 
Yes. Walk to the CVS to get some, you know, some um, pain reliever to bring the fever down. Having to wait for my roommate, cousins to get home, to take me to Children's Health Care of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think, like, that is such a privilege to be able to get in your car, take your son, take him to be seen, them to bring down his temperature. Absolutely not. That threw anything that I was thinking about savings out of, out, it threw it out of sorts. What, what do you think it means to, to, sit, to, have, to be a student sitting across the table from someone who actually has lived it versus sitting across the table from someone who really doesn't understand. I mean, you're really, that's, that's huge. Just the, the, the lack of shame and judgment, I think, is, is re you're removing a huge hurdle to progress just by taking away that feeling that I'm sharing something with you that you don't understand and you're going to judge me for it. I, 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 I think is liberating. For them, I think you can like see their like dispositions change when you know. Because first they're like, "Oh, this well dressed woman is in here with her pearls and one talking to me. She doesn't live any life. She hasn't lived any life." And I was like, "Listen, I always say, listen, don't let the pearls and this blue suit fool you." I have, and so I'll I'll share with them in doses because everybody is not is not ready for that. Mm -hmm. But once they open up and they see, I had a student say to me, oh, yeah, Ms. Palmer, game, recognize game, and, and you, you're you for real. Yeah. <laughs> I remember him saying that. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've lived life. And once you're able to peel back appearances mm -hmm. and get real with people, or I, I find myself sometimes like a, a orientations, you know, throughout my experience, telling like, a high-level story, because, yeah. you know, orientation, you can't just tell it all. It's all very aspirational. And people, like, I remember, like, being at AIU, and we would do orientations a few times a year. I remember just kind of, like, telling my story as well as telling an overview of the program. And after after orientation, like, there would be people waiting. And I never understood what that was. Mm -hmm. but, but it was like, uh, there was, like, some kind of, like, connection. And so when when I'm sitting across from a student, and I'm like, I see you, or I'm like, oh, let me walk with you. You know, how is, you know, because sometimes it's just conversational. How was your train ride in? Mm -hmm. how, was, how was your morning? Or somebody coming in looking disheveled and they're normally not disheveled. Like, mm -hmm. hey, what's going on? Just having, to, you know, having those small talk conversation and, and getting past that. Because sometimes we can be punitive because if we have rules. Like sometimes you have rules, right? Mm -hmm. And so say, for example, you know, Jane Doe came in and she's she's late, which is against the rules. Sure. She's disheveled, which is against the rules in terms of professionalism. Sure. And she's normally like not like that. If I'm not dialed into Jane Doe, what I see, mm -hmm. and I'm only dialed into rules, mm -hmm. I miss an opportunity. Because if my first request as she walks through the door is like, you're late. Where have you been? Why are you late? Then she's hearing more of what she's hearing in her head. Oh, my God. That's huge. And so I, I, I take the, the strategy of, oh, hey, how are you doing today? What's going on with you? You know, I remember seeing yesterday you had on your pearls. What's going on? How are you? Mm -hmm. How's your baby? You know, you have those conversations. Child care looking, you know, you having like a walking conversation. Sure. And, you know, I've had conversations where I've done that. And they were like, Ms. Palmer, I, I, I slept outside last night. Oh, my. Or, Ms. Palmer, I, I have not eaten in 48 hours. The food that I have, I gave to my, my children. Or I haven't been asleep because I work overnight and then, you know, I have to catch the train to drop my kids off at daycare and then I have to be here. And, and so it requires a different person. It requires somebody that sees you. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm able to see people because my experience is so closely related. My journey is so closely related so I can see it a mile away. You know, the days at food pantries, done that. The days of walking, didn't have transportation, done that. The days of not having a ride to child care, done that. And those experiences form every decision that I make. Tracy, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you and to hear your story and, and the stories of the parents you're working with. Thank you for, for, for having me. I just... I, I think like this moment is like is, is is like full circle because many times we keep our stories to ourselves. Yes. 
and they don't benefit others and our stories are meant to be told. If you'd like to learn more about Year Up, Perscalis, or Nanograms, check out the links in our show notes. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us again for the Mother Project podcast.